Okay, so we're going to continue with the discussion on trait theory. Let me just pull up the slides. All right. So just to give you an idea of what trait theory is about, you may recall in lecture one, we talked about the difference between traits and states. Now, traits tend to be relatively stable and they tend to be uh, adjectives to describe a person. Now, if we were going to look for uh, traits, we wanna look at consistent patterns that uh, allow you to predict a certain set of behaviors uh, based on identity factors. Now, traits are relatively stable. So who you are at um, 330 or 300, joke, no one's gonna live to 300, but um, who you are is relatively stable. That isn't to say that there aren't any factors that can fluctuate, but in general, your traits are stable. So uh, we have used the concept of trait theory to profile criminals and try and understand what makes a person tick. Uh, what's interested in, interesting in uh, this approach is that uh, we've done a pretty good job. And if you look at forensic psychology, there are a whole host of uh, clinical profilers who identify serial killers and they try and figure out, well, what's their MO or modus operandus? Um, and they do a good job. Now, if you were to crack open a dictionary and look at the adjectives that describe a person, there are thousands of them. And in fact, Gordon Alpert um, found 18,000. And because we add new words to the dictionary every year, there's even more than that now. Um, so trying to study personality and understanding that traits are adjectives that describe a person, we need to find a way to pare this down or shrink this a bit because trying to give a person a survey that has 18,000 items is not going to work very well. So um, we need to pare it down or reduce it. Another interesting thing about trait theory is that it's been applied to pop culture um, and, you know, in fact, uh, people write papers and articles about uh, celebrities and their personality structure. Now, but trying to understand personality uh, goes all the way back to the time of the Bible. And if you open up the Old Testament or the, the New Testament, uh, you will see that there are key figures that get highlighted in different books of the Bible. And when you read about these individuals, many times there's descriptions. So if I were going to ask you, well, what was Abraham in the book of Genesis? What was Abraham's essence? Well, uh, one would argue based on the description it, he was a gracious and kind individual. He was exceedingly compassionate and he was hospitable. Well, how do we know? Well, these are some of the descriptions that we see about Abraham and some of the storyline that, that we see. Um, for example, it, it describes him as having a tent open on all sides and that was to invite people in and hospitality. Uh, if we were to look at Moses, well, Moses is described as the most humble of all prophets, right? Uh, according to the Jewish tradition, right? Uh, in fact, if you look in Exodus, there's a whole debate between um, so to speak, God and Moses, why, why he was selected to lead the Jewish people out of Egypt. And he said, oh, I'm, 
uh, Moses says, oh, I have a speech impediment. I'm not really that great, you know, and, and ultimately uh, that was a sign of his humility. And you could do this with many, many individuals within the Bible and try and understand their personality. If we move a little bit fast forward to Hippocrates. Now we learned about Hippocrates already uh, and the humors already in lecture four. Now Hippocrates, you know his name because you've heard of the Hippocratic Oath, same philosopher. And according to Hippocrates, he believed that there were four bodily humors or fluids, and they were designed to explain your temper. So if you had a sanguine um, personality, uh, or if we looked at blood flow, we, we might see a person as hopeful and cheerful. If a person had black bile, they were described as melancholic, right? And that may, would indicate that maybe they're sad and depressive. Uh, if a person was choleric, which is yellow bile, it might be angry and irritable. And if they were described as phlegmic, well, then that person would be slow and apathetic. And these were the four humors. Now, you may remember that Adler applied uh, these humors as well into his theory. Theophrastus, which is uh, a student of Aristotle, he created the concept of character sketches. And uh, a character sketch is a brief description of a person. Uh, and we, we still use that today. Now I talked to you about profilers, they use character sketches and character means personality or description of the person, not just their physical image. And in this approach, uh, we see that there's 30 different personality types according to Theophastus. Then fast forward to uh, the 1800s and 1900s, we start to get a different shift. So Charles Darwin, which you heard about already in lecture five, um, talked a lot about natural selection. So trying to understand personality or individual differences, this becomes central to science. And Charles Darwin argued that your personality is inherited. So who you are and these individual differences that you have are linked to some kind of evolutionary process. And same thing with his cousin, uh, Francis Galton. He also believed in, in the genetic explanation of human abilities, but he created this laboratory in London, an anthropometric laboratory in London, where he had you do a whole bunch of tests to describe uh, one's abilities, right? So he shifts the focus of individual differences towards intelligence testing. Now, did he get it right in his description? The answer is no. Actually, Galton's view on mental tests, as you will learn in the history of psychology, was based on physical strength or physical acuity. And that really doesn't make much sense. And it was Alfred Binet who actually creates the first successful intelligence test. But nevertheless, Galton plays a role in trying to understand uh, mental abilities. And then we shift to Freud. Freud was uh, 1800s to roughly the middle 1900s. He tries to understand personality through the unconscious and human motivation. Uh, and what's great about the 1800s forward is that a whole bunch of really advanced statistics start to come into, uh, into play. And that helps us with psychological testing. That helps us with uh, trying to develop what we call a modern trait theory. So this also should be a, a review, but we had Carl Jung, right? So Carl Jung, uh, described various aspects, introversion and extroversion. So introversion is you turn inward to explore oneself. 
uh, you process internally versus an extrovert uh, turns outward towards other people. Now, one of the, the myths is that introverts are always shy. Introverts are actually not always shy. For example, uh, the former president, Barack Obama, he's an introvert. Now, if you looked at him on a campaign trail or you looked at him giving interviews, you would be like, there's no way he's an introvert because he's so personable and charismatic. So there it must be that an introvert means something more than just being shy or reserved. It means that when you have decisions to make, you turn inward, you uh, provide quiet and distance uh, for processing. Uh, whereas an extrovert, uh, they will phone all their friends uh, when they're on vacation, their focus would be going to parties and clubs and extrovert, they turn outward. So they get gain energy from those outside of themselves, whereas an introvert might be exhausted by that. All right. Now, he also, Carl Jung also talks about the different concepts of sensing and intuiting and thinking and feeling and judging and perceiving and all these different um, aspects, right? So sensing is more prone to realism, whereas intuiting is more prone to imagination. Thinking is based on concrete logic, whereas feeling is subjective experience uh, and judgment and perception deal with evaluating things. Now, uh, what's interesting, actually, before I move on, what's interesting is that Carl Jung influenced psychological testing. So you may have heard of the term the Myers-Briggs, right? The Myers-Briggs trait inventory uh, is designed to assess various traits and it comes straight out of Carl Jung's work. Now the Myers-Briggs is a highly effective test for the um, occupational world. But the Myers-Briggs is actually not uh, as good of a predictor of personality as other tests we have on the market, which we'll talk more about. Now, let's fast forward to Cattell. We said that we have statistics develop. Well, Raymond Cattell uses a form of statistics called factor analysis. Now, factor analysis is basically a fancy correlation, and it looks at all the factors that uh, are related to one another and clusters them together. So remember how we said Gordon Alpert uh, found 18,000 words to describe personality? Mm. So that's not gonna work. So Cattell used factor analysis and clustered it down to 16 primary factors of personality. That's a big difference, right? So when you start, with 18,000 and you reduce it to 16, now we can create a test that's measurable. Now we could create a test. Now, who was Cattell? Well, Cattell was a student of Spearman. Now, Spearman, you may have heard the term Spearman Row, right? That's a statistical test as well. Um, and Spearman also was the one who came up with the concept of G, for intelligence or general intelligence. All right, so um, as I mentioned, he started with 18,000 descriptions of personality and broke it down into 16 personality factors or primary factors. Now, uh, how did he collect data? Well, he looked at many aspects of data uh, to try and understand personality. And the 16 factors questionnaire focuses a lot on test data, but he said, if you wanna adequately measure personality, you need Q data, T data, and L data. Q data is self-report or questionnaire data. T data is test data, which is putting a person in a controlled environment, doing an experiment, see what comes of it. And then L data is getting information life uh, life data or record review, things like that. Now here, 
are the 16 primary factors and each of the primary factors are on a spectrum, right? So you can have a low range, you can have a high range. So let's take uh, one of them on, on this slide, emotional stability, right? So if a person scores low on the factor of emotional stability, we would argue or we would find in that person, I should say, that that person is emotionally reactive they're affected more by their feelings. They have lower ego strength and whatnot. Whereas a person who has high emotional stability, they tend to be described as mature, uh, calm, um, very regulated individuals who have higher ego strength. All right. Now, Gordon Alpert, his definition of personality, and it's interesting, I, I want you to hold on to this because we talked about Cattell and talk about Alpert, but we did define personality in the first lecture, right? So uh, what is personality according to Gordon Alpert? And I'm gonna draw some intention, some attention to key words. So according to Gordon Alpert, personality is the dynamic organization within the individual of those psychophysical systems that determine character, behavior, and thought. That def that's a beautiful definition. But what we have, uh, which is interesting, is the word dynamic, dynamic organization, which means that the factors that are influencing how you react to a situation are always moving, always in flux, right? So you have that dynamic organization. It's it's movable, it's adjustable, uh, and you might argue, as we'll see in lecture 10, that this is an argument for less stability of personality. All right, within the individual, so personalities within you, unique to the individual, of those psychophysical systems. So psychophysical is two parts. Uh, psycho means psychological or mentalistic, physical are the physical elements that drive thoughts and behaviors, right? So he's acknowledging both um, biological, cognitive, and um, what's not highlighted here, but he also acknowledges it, are environmental or social factors that influence personality. So there are internal forces, there are external forces, there's physical, cognitive, and socio-emotional forces at play. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, definition when you think about it. Now, um, he met Freud as many of the early psychologists did, uh, and he started to want to understand personality on a much deeper level rather than a superficial level. So you start to see some of the uh, unconscious factors at play as well. Now, also Gordon Alpert was interested in studying prejudice. So um, he examined groups that were affected by prejudice in his day in the United States, uh, which were Jews and African-Americans. What's interesting is that women were also discriminated against, uh, but uh, his focus were on ethnic and religious minorities. Now, in addition, um, as he studies prejudice, he adds the value of culture and how culture plays a role in personality. Uh, and that's true, right? So that's very, very true. And research suggests that um, the environment plays a role. In fact, if you study collectivistic cultures versus individualistic cultures, you will see that the personalities are different and the value systems are different across culture. All right. So in terms of Gordon Alper, he felt that human, um, human beings are highly complex. So trying to uh, break people down to basic stimulus response pairings like the behaviorists did, behavioral input, uh, pardon me, uh, environmental input, behavioral output, stimulus response, or Cattell boiling people down to these 16 factors wasn't good enough. He, he felt that it was a mistake 
and people actually behave differently across situations. And Cattell's 16 factors didn't capture this and the behaviorist model didn't fully capture this. Now, in all fairness though, there is some level of stability within behavior. There are regularities. So the question is how would Gordon Alpert explain that people have typical response patterns? And he says, well, uh, if you perceive many situations the same way, your perception of the situation is gonna influence your behavioral response, right? Um, and also, you know, the uh, behaviors themselves, many of them have similar meanings. So the behavioral output might have some patterns, but it's because of how we group uh, or perceive the meaning of behaviors. Now, this uh, concept is what we call functional equivalence, right? So uh, functional equivalence means the behavior of the individual have similar meaning uh, because people tend to view many situations the same way. So that creates consistency, right? So, and according to Gordon and Alper, it's the trait, which is the internal structure that causes this regularity. Now, uh, and when you do factor analysis, which is what Cattell, Raymond Cattell did, uh, he argues that factor analysis can identify a cluster, but it doesn't fully uh, name it. All right, so what are some of these traits? There are common traits. Common traits are traits which groups of individuals in a population share. Uh, so we share a biological heritage, we share cultures, um, many times many cultures are similar and because of that uh, there's going to be a common set of values or behaviors so let's uh, go back to the concept of individualistic societies versus collectivistic societies uh, on a large scale so population level uh, the United States is a westernized nation and one of the most individualized nations across the globe. So to be individualistic, uh, one of the core values in American culture is assertiveness. So speak up for yourself, speak out, fight injustice, don't conform. All of these are values within Western and individualized nations, whereas um, collectivistic societies, which are more common in the Caribbean, uh, in African nations, and in Western, South, and East Asian nations, they tend to have higher rates of collectivism. This assertiveness could be dishonorable. So you'll see different traits depending on where you're at. Now, in terms of motivation, motivation is formed in one's childhood, uh, but eventually uh, that motivation becomes independent or uh, you become independent, let me say this, of your childhood experience. And he says, this makes you functionally autonomous. So we move beyond our childhood and that influences us. So whereas Freud puts a strong emphasis on early childhood experience, Gordon Alpert says the origins aren't as uh, important. Now in terms of uh, what is the essence of personality, uh, Gordon Alpert refers to this as your proprium or your core of your personality and it has a strong biological piece. Now, when you study people trying to do large scale testing has uh, less value according to Gordon Alpert. And he felt that we should study uh, people through an ideographic method. Now you may recall ideographic looks for the uniqueness of the individual. Whereas a nomothetic method looks for general norms or averages. So when we talk about Gordon Alpert, 
uh, let he has these three elements, right? So personal dispositions, cardinal dispositions, and central dispositions. Now you might hear it referred to as cardinal traits, central traits, and so forth. So um, it's important when we study personality to, to highlight the uniqueness of the individual because no two people are exactly alike. Even when we do twin studies, we don't find identical twins are identical in personality. They have greater similarities than non-twins, but they're not identical in personality. So now let's talk about personal dispositions. These are um, unique to the individual. These are unique traits that a person might have uh, that separates them out from other people. Then we have, these might be your quirks or idiosyncrasies, right? Then you have cardinal traits, which are your passions of life. Uh, and if I were going to say cardinal traits, this would be more about your essence or your um, who, what makes you who you are. So if you were gonna use a word, if I were to ask you to describe yourself using one word, uh, you likely would be targeting cardinal dispositions or cardinal traits. This would be your essence. Whereas um, central dispositions, central, uh, these are many per personality factors that drive a person. Uh, so you take a bunch of personal dispositions, it becomes a central disposition. And we have a bunch of central dispositions and then we have largely one essence, which is a cardinal disposition. Now with all of this emphasis on ideographic methods, Gordon Alpert did not believe that we should throw away or ignore nomothetic approach entirely. He just felt that it had less value uh, than uh, Cattell put on it. So let's talk about a game changer. Costa and McRae uh, comes up with the big five. Now, what they do is they take Cattell's 16 factors and further aggregate them into five uh, personality factors. And you may have heard a mnemonic for them. So how, how many of you have heard the mnemonic ocean? Right, ocean is the most common mnemonic for the big five. Or you might have heard a mnemonic canoe, which is just a reorganization of the five letters. So let's talk about these five personality factors. According to Costa McRae, you have levels of surgency or E for extroversion, right? We talked about low scoring low versus high on this. And uh, people who score lower on extroverts tend to be more reserved, tend to be more quiet. Now, I don't particularly care for the fact that your book describes them as shy, but uh, nevertheless, it is sometimes the case, so we'll go there. Agreeableness is your cooperativeness, your friendliness. So people who score low on agreeableness uh, are more likely to be quarrelsome. People are openness, tend to be curious. They tend to look for uh, new experiences. Uh, they have high creativity, imagination, whereas people score low on this uh, aspect of personality tend to uh, be more shallow and superficial. Neuroticism is anxiety prone. So people who score high on neuroticism tend to have higher levels of anxiety. People who score low tend to be relatively emotionally stable and calm and conscientiousness is um, your level of dependability or responsibility. So let's look at some questions that assess um, extroversion. So I talk a lot. So you rate that from one to five. So if, if you say very true of me, that leads you towards extroversion. I'm quiet around strangers. Well, that 
wouldn't be an extrovert, that would be an introvert. So that would be reverse coded. So saying not true of me would actually make you more extroverted. And I'm the life of the party. Obviously that's extroversion. Agreeableness, uh, I make others feel at ease. I tend to forgive others. I'm not interested in other people's problems, which is, would not be agreeableness. This would be more quarrelsome. Conscientiousness, I'm always well prepared. I persevere in my task. I may shirk my responsibilities, which means to skip out and not do. Um, that would be reverse coded. Neuroticism is I get irritated easily. I'm calm most of the time. Well, that would be a person who's not neurotic. Uh, and then I worry a lot. And then openness, I have many ideas. I prefer abstract ideas. Um, and then um, I don't spend much time reflecting on things, right? So this is the depth of creativity and curiosity we're looking at. So the big five, it was heavily based on research and from the research, the theory of big five was formed. Now, what's interesting is that the big five has a lot of research support and it has cross-cultural validity. Now, uh, that does not mean that these big five are the only way of understanding personality, right? So uh, be careful with uh, whether people agree with these five traits and maybe the, uh, the big five doesn't fully capture who, you, who we are. All right. So, uh, but it, as I said, it's fantastic. It has been supported. It's been studied in all six inhabited continents, um, Antarctica, although it's minimally inhabited, that's usually research teams. Uh, it has cross-cultural validity, has been supported. So there's some sensitivity there. But there is some challenge to whether five is the right number. We learned about Einstein, right, in lecture five. And we heard about Cattell earlier today, which Einstein said there were three factors and Cattell said there are 16 factors. So not everyone agrees with the number of dimensions that fully capture personality. I think you may remember he has extroversion, neuroticism and psychoticism. Extroversion, we already described. Neuroticism, we already described. Psychoticism is um, your tendency towards psychopathology, right? So um, Einstein picked these three because they somehow were linked to biology, even though the jury is still out. So do we agree with personality judgments? Well, be careful uh, with uh, your evaluation of personality judgments because uh, it is possible to have a false consensus. It's possible that we look for things, we label it the same thing, uh, but we may miss the boat, right? So uh, evaluating false consensus, or con I should say evaluating consensus, then false consensus is important. So do, do, do multiple evaluators see the same thing? Yes or no? And if they do, did they get it right? So there are ways to evalu evaluate that. So zero, zero acquaintance uh, increases uh, the agreement across judgments. Um, and that's interesting, right? Because there's more objectivity. Now we talk about type A, type B personality. A person who's type A is high strung, very competitive, but it, a type A personality tends to link one to a lot of health problems. Type B tends to be more relaxed and easygoing personality, um, less prone to medical problems. Now motives, uh, Henry Murray, he talked about psychogenic needs. So he argues that we all have basic uh, needs or, or motivations. And it's interesting, Henry Murray comes out of the psychodynamic school of thought. So you'll you'll see it's linked to Freud and his followers. So we have a need for achievement. We all have some level of need to be successful, uh, to 
um, meet the meet goals that are set out for us to be appreciated for being successful in those tasks. We have a need for power, right? All of us have a need for power to a greater or lesser degree. Now it's on a spectrum like all of these are. So a need for power would be the need to control other people. So here, you know, this one, if you have too much, it can be problematic uh, at its extreme. And uh, so instead of just dominating, we also have a need for affiliation, which is to have closeness and, and connection. We also have a need for um, exhibition to entertain or make people laugh. Now, there are a lot of needs in here to give you an idea. Here are 20 different needs uh, related to the self or related to others, um, which are psychogenic needs. Now, shifting us towards positive psychology, you have Cantor who describes personality through the lens of life tests or people have goals, right? So life test is a specific goal which is one example might be to finish college. And I, I know that we're in very challenging times with coronavirus, but that is a goal. And well, a similar description of goals is Emmons, another positive psychology, describes these as personal strivings, which are the kind of goals that people try and achieve in day-to-day -day behavior. Now, um, what are factors that impact your personal strivings. If you have ambivalence or conflict, that might interfere with you accomplishing your goals, right? So if people uh, are neurotic, uh, they tend to develop avoided strategies to address their goals. So it doesn't work, but it's what they do. Now, you wanna measure motivation? Well, it's complicated too, right? Because motivation changes across time and situation. Um, so that's an issue. Maybe when you measure it at point one, it'll be different at point two. So it could be time consuming. Now we do have the personality research form, which is a relatively quick and easy way to assess these needs. And then we have the TAT, which was a projective test, which we described uh, earlier in the semester. Um, I'm gonna draw the blinds. Give me one second, the sun's in my eye. All right, sorry about that. Now we also look at expressive style, which is how you communicate with nonverbals. So gesturing, eye contact, voice, things of that nature. Um, all of these play a role. Now let's put it all together. Um, when we look at traits, human beings are a cluster of temperaments, traits, and skills. What's a nice way of this approach of personality? It, breaks people down into uh, small parts, uh, some basic dimensions. It allows for psychological testing and comparison across large scales of people, but also celebrates individual differences. Now, uh, one of the challenges is that sometimes we uh, could oversimplify people. We could label people based on the test results and we could ignore uh, early experiences. Now. According to trait and skill approach, uh, there, are free, there is free will to a limited degree. Now, the assessment techniques are some of the same ones we've talked about. Now, in terms of the role of trait theory in psychotherapy, so when we look at personality it's structured around these dimensions, so we want to find um, what these demand, the, the dimensions that are affecting the pathology, we wanna identify them, right? And help shape them. But we don't want to view them as uh, static. We wanna view them as dynamic, like Gordon Alpert said, uh, and changeable. And that is our lecture in a nutshell. So I'm gonna stop sharing there and I'm gonna stop recording and we'll go from there.